So there have been two papers published this week about one of our favourite subjects, and that's black holes. In particular, what's it like falling into black holes? Now I've gone and spoken to Tony all about it, and he's given a bit of an overview of what's in the papers, a bit of a taste. And also in this video, I've done a few illustrations and graphics just to dress things up a little bit, so don't take them too seriously. If you do want to read the papers themselves and see the slightly more dry diagrams in the papers, go and have a look at them. I've put the links in the video description under this video. They're free to go and have a look at. But I should warn you, they're a little bit on the complicated side. Every morning we read uh, our academic papers that have come out. Uh, and there has been something really interesting happening today and, and, and this week. Basically, we, we're rethinking what we think happens when you fall into a black hole. So the pitch has changed completely. There's some real big shots over in uh, California that are sort of, they've, there was one paper out, this one out a couple of days ago. There was this one by Lenny Suskind, which was out today, uh, which is sort of completely rethinking uh, what happens when you fall into a black hole. So it's, it's pretty big stuff. So the way that we traditionally thought of what happens in, as you fall into a black hole, well, it kind of depends on, on whose perspective you're taking it from. So if, you know, imagine me and you, Brady, we went to a black hole. Uh, you stayed on the outside of the black hole and annoyingly decided to chuck me in. So I'm falling towards it. The black hole's over there somewhere, imagine, right? So I'm, I'm drifting towards it, accelerating towards it. Now, what do you see? You see my clock slowing down. So you see sort of essentially time slowing down for me, so as if I'm suspended. Imagine the event horizon of the black hole is here. As I approach it, your time is slowing down from your, what you see. And like literally, I'll, as I approach the event horizon, I would then stop. You would see my, you know, time stop for me. Now, where is all this happening? This is all happening on this, what's called a stretched horizon, which surrounds, this little region that surrounds the event horizon. It's a thermal region, it's hot. So you would see me suspended, okay? Then you would see me thermalize. Well, literally, I would sort of burn up, okay? And then I would come back to you as a stream of Hawking radiation. This is the type of radiation which comes out of a black hole which bears the name of Stephen Hawking. Now, that's what you saw watching me fall into the black hole, okay? Now, what would I see as I fell into the black hole? What would I actually see myself? Well, this is the old picture. This is what's changed. Now, there's nothing special, at least we thought there was nothing really special about a black hole event horizon, really. It's not a region of strong curvature, strong, strong gravitational fields. It's just a place in space where something weird does happen, but there's nothing strong about the gravitational fields there. And because of that, by Einstein's principle of equivalence, nothing really weird should happen as you cross it. And indeed, that's what we thought was the case, that as you cross a black hole event horizon, as I'm falling through the black hole event horizon, from my perspective, what do I see? I don't see anything much. So you just see me pointing the camera at you the whole time? Yeah, and then eventually, you know, okay, there'll be some effect, time effects of, you know, our relative, um, due to our relative velocities. But generally, within the region, I wouldn't see anything remarkable happen as I crossed the event horizon. Eventually, after a long time, if it was a big enough black hole, I would approach the, uh, the black hole singularity which is miles back over there now, right? Okay, but I would approach the black hole singularity. There, there are strong gravitational fields. There, I would turn to spaghetti, and, uh, you know, it would be good night me. Um, I don't know why it had to be me that fell into the black hole, by the way. <laughs> so these papers, which one which came out earlier this week, the other which came out today, are discussing that process. Not from your point of view, Brady, watching me fall in. I think everyone still agrees on that. But from the point of view of the guy falling in. So this statement that nothing much happens as you cross the black hole horizon. People aren't saying that's the case now. And these are real big guns, right? These are guys in Santa Barbara and at Stanford who, uh, you know, have made their names in, in for various other uh, topics in physics in, in, and including black hole physics. And, you know, these, these, are, these are big guys. What do I see now as I fall into the black hole? Well, it's a lot more unpleasant. Essentially, as you approach the black hole horizon, you just get across it and then splat, you hit what's called a firewall. They're calling it a firewall, you can see. So essentially the black hole horizon, if the black hole is old enough, it has to be an old enough black hole, um, the horizon will turn into a firewall. And you will literally, 
space and time would just end for you. It was essentially like a black hole singularity, but now it's jumped right out towards the event horizon. It's tricky. I don't think I fully understand it myself yet. As I said, I only read <laughs> this paper this morning, so yeah, I'm still absorbing it. Um, okay, so let's give it a go. They're applying quantum mechanics and the logic of quantum mechanics to, to a black hole to come to this conclusion. And in particular, I said here, I said at one point that this black hole had to be an old enough black hole. Now, what, what do I mean by old? An old black hole in this context is one that has emit, emitted, you know, at least half of the information it contained when it was formed. OK, so, you know, a black hole forms and then it gives off this radiation. It's emitted at more than half of that radiation. If that's the case, then you have something important that happens. So I want you to imagine basically a little bit of radiation which came out early and a little bit of radiation that is just coming out now, okay, or it's come out late and it's sort of sitting on the edge of the stretched horizon. Now they are entangled. If the black hole is old enough, those two bits of radiation are entangled. Those two points are entangled as in the exterior region where all the radiation is and the edge of the stretched horizon. Basically, what does I mean by them being entangled? I mean, well, they essentially know about each other. If I know about the, the radiation out here, I can know about the radiation sort of on the edge of the horizon. Here's the other statement. There's supposed to be nothing special about the black hole horizon. Okay? That's what we previously thought. So, now you've got this little bit of radiation just outside of the stretched horizon. There's nothing special about the event horizon. So imagine something just inside the event horizon, but still inside this stretched horizon. Well, those two are also going to be entangled because they're so close to one another. There's nothing special about the horizon. So they're entangled as well. Okay, so now you have a situation where the thing on the, just outside the horizon is completely determined by the thing very far away and also the thing just inside the horizon. But the thing very far away and the thing just inside the horizon are completely independent systems. And you can't have something controlled by two completely independent systems. Okay, so what the conclusion is, there must be actually something wrong with our assumptions there. And the conclusion is that the thing that's wrong is that the horizon is a special place, that the two points on either side of the event horizon, but still living in this stretched horizon, are actually you know, they aren't entangled, they, are, you know, they don't know about each other. And the implication then is, is that, you know, literally you have a, you have a singular point, you have a, a singularity, you have a large region of space-time curvature at the horizon. Okay, and that's essentially what happens. Another way of looking at it is that you will inevitably, you can use these similar arguments to conclude that you will inevitably encounter quanta as you approach the black hole horizon. You will inevitably encounter... Sorry. Hi, uh, can I ring you back? I'm just doing a video with Brady. Okay, no, I'll call you back in. I'm, I'm nearly done. I'm just in the middle of it. All right, bye. So where was I? Um, oh, yeah, so another way of looking at this, um, applying similar arguments, is you can argue that there's, um, as you approach the black hole, you will, event horizon, you will inevitably encounter quanta, so little sort of fluctuations, little particles, little bits of radiation that, um, you know, have high energies. You know, who's any, you know, arbitrarily high in principle. And that, that's what the subject of the first paper was really about, the one by Joe Polchinski and friends. And um, that's why it's a firewall. So that's where they came up with this idea of firewall, yeah. But of course, it's slightly, it gets slightly complicated as well because, you know, the minute you fall in yourself, you alter the position of the would be horizon anyway. So actually, it gets a little bit subtle. So what, what Lenny Suskin's arguing for is that actually, so you fall in, so you don't actually encounter anything immediately, but you do pretty damn quickly, <laughs> okay? Basically, it's proportional to, to your size, you know, to, to how big you are. So, you know, so the sort of, the smaller you are, the quicker you, you will encounter something. It's sort of the, the other debate that they're still arguing about is how old does the black hole have to be? So I, I discussed, you know, it should be more than half the, uh, it should have emitted more than half of its um, radiation. Well, there's some arguments about that, you know, you know, is it this page time or is it something called the fast scrambling time? You know, and that makes quite a bit of difference. For example, if you apply this discussion to a solar mass black hole, so a black hole with the same mass as the sun, to be old enough for this to, to happen, well, 
if you it could be that you, you know such a black hole would would have to be older than the age of the universe for this to be important but also it could be that it might only have to be one tenth of a second old so they're still still arguing the numbers so this old notion of spaghettification is is it being replaced with like this kind of incineration y yeah so so termination is how uh so, okay so this they really actually argue about this in the papers what do you call it so joe Polchinski and that call it burn up okay so actually um lenny suskin complains about that he says it's not burn up that sort of um indicates some sort of gradual process where you burn up almost and um, he actually says it's termination you literally you hit this and then gone you know it just happens <laughs>